Welcome to Ancestors. I'm your host, Scott Wilkinson. War has always separated family members from each other for a few months, for many years, and sometimes for life. But with war comes remembrance. Family members, veterans organizations, the military branches themselves are keenly aware of the need to remember those who serve. There is another way to remember those who've gone before, and that's through family history. Today, we're going to explore military records and how they can open up a window into the lives of your ancestors that served their country. If you have an ancestor who served in the military and you have access to those records, you've got a gold mine. You have records that will give you a description, color hair, color eyes, skin complexion, whether he had a mole on his nose, um, if he walked with a limp, uh, if he was tall or short. So if you do have access to good military records, you have a wonderful resource. For Susan Hadler of Washington, D.C., her search started by looking for someone only one generation away, her own father and the only connection to him was a letter he wrote from the battlefield just after she was born and just before he was killed by a landmine. When I was growing up, um, fortunately, my mother kept a baby book. There on one of the pages was scotch taped into my baby book a letter from my father. And I used to just crawl around behind the chair and take the, my baby book out of the cupboard and um, just look at the letter, because it was a link to my father, and it was the only link that I had. Dear Susan, since I can't be there in person, this is a sort of welcome letter. Yours is a pretty good family, as families run. Your dad is a bit on the off side, but your mother and brother, and now you, more than make up for that. Your mother is the most wonderful person I've ever known. I've always marveled at my great good fortune to have loved her and been loved by her. If you will follow her dictates and examples, you may expect to meet life in the best possible way, and your path will always be the right one. For me, adhere to a belief in tolerance, a genuine liking for others, and always give to life to the fullest. Your father, Dave. I didn't know much about my father at all. I knew from the time I was born, I think, that my father had been killed in the war. And I knew that that had happened on April 12th, 1945. And I knew his name, David Selby Johnson, Jr. And I knew that he was an only child. I really didn't know anything else. Military records can reveal all sorts of information about an ancestor who served in the military. In fact, records exist for all these wars and conflicts. Of course, not all the records are complete, and not every record has survived. But you can see there's a fairly extensive list of recorded conflicts. Anybody who has been searching for family members who might, might have uh, been in the military will be able to find any number of sources of information regarding family members, regarding length of enlistment, or how long they've been in the uh, military, where they might have been, or at least in general, how they might have served their career. I always longed to know about my father, and I longed for stories about him and to have a sense of him. Um, but my family couldn't talk about him because the loss was so great. Every Veterans Day, every Memorial Day, I thought about my father, and I always wanted a place to go. And in 1992, on Veterans Day, I went to the Veterans Memorial Wall. I saw veterans who were crying, I saw people hugging each other. That touched something so deep in me. I knew at that moment that there, were, there must be others of us whose fathers had been killed in the war. And I just had to find out more about my father. And so then that day when I went home, I 
untypical for me. I called a vet center out of the blue and I said who I was and that my father had been killed in World War II. The man at the vet center gave me the name of Ann Mix, who was the director of the World, American World War II War Orphans Network in uh, Bellingham, Washington. Um, and I was very excited and interested to know this and so I called her right away. She wanted to know more things about my father and just talk about him right then and there than I'd even thought of knowing. She wanted to know what um, battalion he was in and what, what, where he fought and what happened to him. Every little place you go has a piece and then that becomes a mosaic and then you, you start to be able to build a portrait of that person and what happened. Wars create a lot of paper. They create paper at the local level, at the state level, in place in the federal government. Places such as the National Archives and State Archives contain a lot of records about our ancestors and their military service. Military records exist in three major categories, service records, pension records, and military histories. The first of these, service records, cover the period of time your ancestor was actually in service. A compiled military service record consists of an envelope that has the soldier's name on it, his beginning rank, his highest rank or ending rank, the unit that he served on, and it will contain information about your ancestor that is pretty much unique to your ancestor. Things like furlough papers, sometimes medical records, discharge papers. Maybe you'll find the report of the death of your ancestor. Each military engagement has at least one major index to folks that served in that particular engagement. And I would go after those indexes. The National Archives has microfilmed a number of indexes to what we typically think of as service records, which are the muster rolls themselves. In the Civil War, for the Union participants, there is a service record index for each state. For the Confederate states, there's what's called a compiled or consolidated Confederate index that's available that covers the Confederate states. One of the best repositories for 20th century military records is the National Personnel Records Center in St. Louis, Missouri. We house the military personnel records of all five services, Coast Guard, Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines, essentially of uh, veterans who separated from the service from about the turn of the century until the present day. Uh, those who separated prior to the turn of the century, those records are at the National Archives in Washington. Air Force veterans who uh, separated from the Air Force prior to December 31st, 1963, and Army veterans who separated from the Army prior to uh, December 31st, 1959. Their records were involved in a major fire which occurred here on July 12, 1973. Although many records were lost in the fire, the National Personnel Records Center in St. Louis is still an excellent source of information for military records. It's one of several branches of the main repository for military records, the National Archives here in Washington, D.C. Uh, the National Archives holds many records personnel records of soldiers who fought in wars between the American Revolution up to the Philippine insurrection in 1902. The compiled service records were um, created from the muster rolls, hospital rolls, any information the War Department had on a particular individual at the time. There isn't a great deal of uh, biographical information, but it gives the date that he was in a particular place, the unit he was in, and whether he was absent, ill, or, or AWOL. And so you can place an individual in a unit at a specific time. When your search leads you to Revolutionary War records, remember that the originals were kept by the individual colonies rather than by the federal government. But today, many are available in the National Archives. For the Revolutionary War, there's a service record index, um, many rolls of film for those who participated in the Revolutionary War, and those are the best first places to go. While the American Revolutionary War records were kept by individual colonies, the British records from the same war were kept by the central government, and they can be found at the Public Record Office here in London, England. Well, in the Public Record Office, we've got the records of people who've served in the British Army um, from the 18th century onwards. We've got muster rolls from the late-ish 18th century. They're patchy. We don't have them for every regiment for every year. But you can sort of find people who served in the British Army in the 18th century or in the American Revolutionary Wars. So we've got lists of actual people who were there in America fighting the rebellious colonists 
all the records that we have which relate to the American colonies before 1776 have actually been microfilmed and are available either in the Family History Centres or in your own national archives in Washington. While all these British Army records can actually be seen on microfilm in the States, there's nothing quite like the magic of coming and looking at them in the original here to actually look at the muster roll 1776 for His Majesty's 71st Regiment of Foot, or to look at, for instance, um, petitions from loyalists who'd served in militia regiments um, for the British uh, in the Revolutionary Wars. Um, and then petitioning in 1777, 1770, 78 for some sort of compensation because they've actually lost everything by backing the, the wrong horse in the war. One thing you'll learn about military records is that while they vary in quality and quantity depending upon the war, they also vary depending upon when they were created, the amount of information contained, the number of records that survived, and their availability all get better the more recent the conflict. Now, Susan Hadler requested records from World War II, a fairly recent conflict, and what she received changed her life. Uh, I'll never forget the day this came. It was a cold January day, and it was heart pounding. I opened the um, envelope, and inside were documents, and they were burned along an edge. They were all charred and burned because there had been a fire at the record center. But it seemed to me as if it were part of the war that I was holding because most of it was intelligible. It was the first time that I saw his birthday. And it said that he was born on July 17, 1919. And just seeing that was, um, that was as much as I needed to know. It was wonderful. The next type of military record is the pension record. These records cover the post-service period when your ancestor or their next of kin may have received veterans' pensions. The records that give the most information about an individual are the pension files. And many men and women applied for pension files. Some of them received them, some of them didn't. But even if they applied for it, it can give you a great deal of information. The soldier had to prove that he was in the military and so his neighbors, friends, relatives who were in the unit would testify that he had been in a particular unit, fought in a particular battle. So in a pension record, you begin to get testimony from comrades. That's very important because when you're trying to find all the military records, when you get names of other soldiers and names of commanding officers, you can look for letters and diaries that other veterans wrote about the same unit that your ancestor was in that may provide you with just golden nuggets of information. One of the best things you can find at a pension is that the pensioner was rejected for his pension. And then he spends years trying to convince the federal government that he, in fact, is deserving of the pension. So these pension records can be four and five inches thick and full of medical affidavits and statements by neighbors about the capacity of the soldier um, and whether he can make a living or what kind of person he is. I happen to be in Washington, D.C., and going to the National Archives for other reasons. But since I was there, I actually asked, you know, asked for this pension, and I started going through it. It turns out that my great-great-grandmother married a War of 1812 veteran. He was 78, and she was 30. He was white. She was listed as mulatto, and she collected his pension. And that pension just tied everything in together. The first step in, in learning about whether your ancestor has a pension record or not is to consult the pension indexes, which are on microfilm for every war. For the Revolutionary War, they are a separate index. The War of 1812 and Mexican War are separate. But records from 1861 to 1934 are a single consolidated index. The kind of information that you might find on them depends on the war. Like in the case of the Civil War, you, you, you will get the name of the soldier, you get the unit he served from or units that he served from. You, if his wife survived him, you'll find her name if she applied for a pension. These indexes on microfilm can be found um, in local family history centers, available from various microfilm rental programs, the National Archives microfilm, microfilm rental program, or in the National Archives itself or any of its branch archives. In searching the military records, specifically the pension records for my cousin who had served in the Civil War, 
I found a wonderful description of him as he applied for a uh, increase in pension. It was taken at age 61. It described for me his physical appearance. He was six foot two, had blue eyes, dark complexion, dark hair. It was almost like I could hear him breathing and hear his heartbeat. Uh, it was, he came alive for me when I read that. Another important record is the military or unit history. Unit histories, often written by veterans groups, add historical background that really helps you understand the conflict and your ancestors' role in it. It was not uncommon after a conflict for a unit historian or some other individual to collect information from, from soldiers and to create a unit history. This means the Revolution, the Mexican War, the Civil War, basically any conflict that we've been involved in. Now, in later years, in this century, many individuals have taken it upon themselves to create unit histories for past units. Uh, a perfect example is the Virginia Regimental Series, where almost every Virginia regiment in the Confederacy, it, in fact, has a small unit history with a description of the involvement of the unit, and even a roster of men who were in the unit, and a little bit of information about each man who served. A wonderful way to explore military histories is to join a lineage organization a group of people whose ancestors shared a common bond, like service in a war or a conflict. Now, there are lots of lineage societies, like the Sons of Union Veterans of the Civil War and the Daughters of the American Revolution. There are many patriotic lineal and heritage societies today, and of course the DAR is one of the largest of the patriotic societies. And regardless of the one that you belong to, whether it's an organization that traces the lineage just to a particular time period, or a war period, they're all vitally important because they all use the tracing of lineage and background history and promotion of love of country. The library was established, uh, the main purpose of it was to originally serve the staff of the genealogy department in their efforts to uh, approve application papers of potential members for the National Society. Then after the first few years, uh, when the collection began to grow, it became apparent that uh, the public should be allowed to use it. Uh, there weren't too many genealogical collections in the country, and certainly not here in Washington, except at the Library of Congress. And as a result, uh, they started letting the public come in. So shortly after the turn of the century, uh, the public was allowed to come in and use the library, and they've been able to come in ever since. I like to know about what my ancestors did, why they did it. Why did they go to battle? Why did they fight for what they fought for? And by looking in military records, sometimes in their own words, I can determine where they were, why they were there, how they felt. By looking at unit histories, I can tell the entire history of the unit. I may not know specific information about what my ancestor did, but I have a general idea. And by doing things like walking the battlefield, I get a sense of being right there with my ancestor and walking where they walked. As I was gathering information and reading the troop histories and the records, desire grew in me to be as close to my father as I could possibly in this life come. I wanted to stand in the places that he had stood. I wanted to see what his eyes had seen. I wanted to find the places that he had passed through. And if possible, I wanted to find the place that he had been killed. My husband and I decided that we would go to Europe and spend a month searching for these places. Um, and so I, uh, before we went, I had written to the captain and I asked him to tell me as nearly as he could the, every place that my father had been and especially the place that he had died. So I had his letter and I had the records um, of the investigation of my father's death and I had um, the troop histories and I took all of this with me. Um, we went to Luxembourg which is where my father's name is on the wall of missing in the American military cemetery. We arrived at the cemetery gates late in the afternoon and so I walked over to find his name and it was there <laughs> and it was there and um, for me it's um, amazing because I was kind of born into death I was born into his death and it's so it's kind of all come 
um, it's backwards for me. I'm finding his life. And even to see his name is a sign that he lived. We drove down to Mesherneck, which is the town outside of which he was killed. And it's a, um, it's a hilly little town with a railroad track running through it. And off to the right, there was a grove of trees. And I instantly knew, I was just drawn to that grove of trees. And I knew that was the spot. And as I walked down this old, cracked, broken road through the trees, I saw two jagged blocks of concrete on my right. And I, I thought, immediately, I thought, well, that, those could have been blown there by the explosion. And so I just instinctively turned to my right, and I walked up an incline. And I came to a place that was cordoned off by barbed wire. And it was, um, it was a crater. And there were ferns that were now blowing in the breeze. And there were three white birch trees that were standing in the center of the crater. And I just sat down. I knew that was the, the place. And I sat down on the edge of the crater. I just sat cross-legged. And I felt as if I was five years old. I was 15. I was 20. And I just talked to my father. And I told him everything that I always wanted him to know. I could just talk to my daddy. And I could call him daddy, and, and he was there. These are your people, and you can connect with them, because that's what remains of them. You may not have inherited any land from them or any great wealth. That doesn't matter. It's, they're still here. You're still a part of it. Uh, you are continuing for them. You, your life will validate theirs to some extent too. By searching a variety of military records, you can learn so much about your ancestors not just when or where they served, but the color of their eyes or who they left behind. And that's what it's all about, discovering your family and connecting with your ancestors. I ordered a marker for my father right here nearby in Arlington. In November of 96, the marker was in place. So eventually I went out to Arlington and um, visited the marker and that's what I've needed. I've needed, it gives me so much, I've needed a place to go and I've needed to see his name and the dates of his life when he was born and when he died. I knew from the time I was born that he had died but it's through the research and it's through the contacts that I've had and now it's through the marker that I know that he, that he did live. Next time on Ancestors. Newspapers do more than chronicle events in history. They can open a window into your past. Lori Davis found this as she made a surprising discovery about her mysterious great-grandmother. I found the first entry, went to the page, and I saw that it said, Beauty Flees San Francisco Fraud Net. You know, she was a high society con woman, I guess. Funding for the Ancestor series is made possible by a grant from the George S. and Dolores Doré Eccles Foundation, proud to support the worldwide effort to bring families together, and by AncestralQuest.com. Every family has a great story just waiting to be discovered. AncestralQuest.com, helping families find their stories and their ancestors for over 50 years. Learn more about finding your family history by visiting the Ancestors website where you can download pedigree charts, access online databases, and explore the ins and outs of genealogical records. The Ancestors Research Kit, Tools for Discovering Your Family History, is now available. The kit guides users through the family history research process and includes instructional videotapes, the Ancestors Guidebook, and key genealogical forms. 
To order, call 1-800-758-0846. A series companion book, In Search of Our Ancestors, is also available.